All right, so with this Zoom platform, uh, we are limited to about 40 minutes of chatting because we do not have the upgraded version running through there. Um, we will be limited to 40 minutes and 100 participants. If you didn't get a chance to log on, don't worry, we'll stick this up on YouTube. So fear not. Let's see, 47 people, holy cow, hi, 47 families and people sitting at home. And I know, my daughter's at home too. Ah. Ha ha, did this work? I see people, I see people, awesome, cool. So we have a chat window, um, all you have to do is just move your, your mouse, if you're on a computer, move your mouse down to the bottom and we have a little chat window that you can pop up. Um, Clint is gonna be typing responses as I am chatting responses, I believe. So, yes, he is nodding. Oh. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll do a little, little intro. Hello, good morning, my name is Becky Barnes and I am a paleontologist with the North Dakota Geological Survey. So my job is dealing with fossils. Anything from dinosaurs to clams and seashells, uh, sea monsters, birds, mammals, you name it. Uh, we deal with all kinds of dead critters. Uh, that's, the, that's the bad thing about being a fossil is you have to be dead. Kind of a prerequisite there. Today's topic, what we're gonna do, is we're gonna do a little Q&A session and talking about mosasaurs. If any of you have seen the movie Jurassic World or maybe Dinosaur Train, or I'm seeing some hands go up, cool. If any of you have seen any of those movies, we're gonna be dealing with a different kind of, oh, a sea monster. Ah, e, ah. Okay, that's our friendly mosasaur, don't worry. He doesn't bite, usually. We would normally be holding our prehistoric fishing trip as well, but due to the current conditions, sadly our prehistoric fishing trip has been canceled. Well, maybe not canceled, hopefully just postponed. So, what is a mosasaur? A mosasaur is a marine reptile. That means it lived in water and it lived at the same time as dinosaurs, but it is not a dinosaur. So the same thing with a pterodactyl, the flying reptiles, they are also not dinosaurs, but they lived at the same time as dinosaurs. So the example that I like to give people using creatures that you may be more familiar with would be a mammal. So a mammal are creatures like us, creatures like your cats or dogs, uh, things with hair, warm blooded, these are, these are mammals. Now, if you take a land mammal, let's use like a cat, and you take a water mammal, that would be like a whale or a dolphin. And let's take a flying mammal. Now there aren't very many of those, so that would be a bat. So if we have a bat and a cat and a whale. Okay, so we have something that flies, something that lives on land, and something that's in the, in the water. Now the same thing would be with the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs are our land creature. Pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, would be our flying creatures. And mosasaurs would be an example of a marine reptile. So they can all live at the same time, but you wouldn't call a bat a flying cat, right? That's just kind of weird. And you wouldn't call a whale a water cat. That's also kind of weird. So it's the same thing where you have different creatures that can live at the same time, but they're doing different things. Here is an example. Great little toy mosasaur here. This is, like I said, a marine reptile. They are closely related, or their closest living relative is a creature called a monitor lizard. Now, different kinds of monitor lizards would be like Komodo dragons, or uh, if you've seen rescuers down under, the villain Joanna would be some kind of a monitor lizard. And instead of having feet, they have flippers. So their arms and their legs have been modified into flippers. And their tail, this one is, a, is an older model, so it doesn't actually have a little tail fluke. It should look like a shark tail coming up here with an extra little, little flange. It should have a little, little fluke up at the top of the tail here, which this model doesn't. And we used to think that these mosasaurs, much like on this model, were very wiggly and that they would swim like a sea snake or they would wiggle their way through the water. And we've discovered since then that that's not really true. Uh, with the findings of the tail fluke, in order to get that fluke to work, like a shark or a tuna, 
you have to have a very rigid body so that your tail is the only thing really that's moving and your body is being pulled against. So these mosasaurs swam like sharks. Kind of cool. Things that you know, we're always discovering new stuff and that's one of the new things that we learned was that mosasaurs now swim like sharks. We have other marine reptiles that lived at the same time as mosasaurs. We have plesiosaurs, so if anybody likes the Loch Ness Monster, do, 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 there we have a plesiosaur. Plesiosaurs are a little different in that they have a very small head, a very long neck. They still have the four flippers that are modified, and they were built a little bit more like a sea turtle than a shark. Maybe a little bit more ponderous, slowly floating through the water column. They were carnivores. So carnivore means that they were meat eaters, and they ate a variety of meat. Some of them ate ammonites, like this thing. So that's an ammonite. Come on, focus camera. So a little ammonite in here. So some of them ate ammonites. Some of them ate other kinds of squid. Squid are, are related to ammonites. Some of them ate fish. Some of them ate other mosasaurs. So they could have been cannibalistic. Kind of creepy. But different food source. And we know they were carnivores because they have really pointy teeth. Dun, 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 dun. Here is a jaw that we collected from up in the Pembina Gorge. You can see all those big pointy teeth on there. Right there. And they're neat because they would lose their teeth just like sharks. You can see these holes these holes of missing teeth in here. And they would drop their teeth when they bit something hard or the tooth got old or the tooth is broken. And so they would lose their teeth and they would regrow new ones just like a shark does. Dinosaurs do the exact same thing where they lose old broken teeth and they grow back new ones. So kind of neat, nice adaptation. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen with you and I'm gonna read through a little Mosasaur book that we just produced. So this is our first book of the prehistories, or prehistories, haha, Mosasaur. And this is talking a little bit about our creature, the Mosasaur. Yep, too far. So it says, sit all around and I'll tell you a tale. Meet our friend Mosasaur, big as a whale. Now some of these Mosasaurs were really, really big. Some of them were not. Some of them were really small, only, only about three feet long for the smallest ones, and some were longer than a bus. So we had all kinds of different sizes of mosasaurs. It says, don't call her dinosaur, yes, a reptile, cousins at best, don't be fooled by her smile. So this is, again, a reptile, it's a marine reptile, it's related to, to the other reptiles that are around, can live at the same time as dinosaurs, but it's not a dinosaur. So if everybody has one takeaway today, if they can forget everything else, remember that mosasaurs are not dinosaurs. All right, she swam in the sea with big fish and small. Squid, fish, or mosasaur, she ate them all. So remember we said this creature could have been a carnivore, well, it was a carnivore, but it could have also been cannibalistic. Was not very picky. Oops. T-Rex was king of the land and the trees. Meanwhile, our Mosasaur, queen of the seas. So fish come with gills to breathe underwater. A Mosasaur lung breathes air like an otter. So they have lungs like all of the rest of us land breathers. Even though it's living in the water, it is a reptile that breathes air, which means it has to come back up to the surface to grab big gulps of air. Hold your breath now and count to 600. That's 10 minutes long for those that wondered. So about, they estimate about the longest that these creatures could hold their breath underwater. It was about 10 minutes, uh, but we don't really know. It could have been longer, could have been shorter. We don't know. It's, it's the really tough part about paleontology is there's not a lot of soft tissue that's preserved. I don't, I don't suggest you try holding your breath though for 10 minutes. That's a long time. Unlike her cousins, the dinos and crocs, whose nests filled with eggs were watched round the clock, she does not lay eggs. Her young are born live. Her baby's precocial, ready to dive. So they, go, they gave birth to live young, not eggs. 
They found live young and the bones of little baby mosasaurs within the birth canals of these animals. And they found little baby mosasaurs that were out swimming in the open sea along with, you know, maybe their parents, maybe they were solo. It's kind of hard to tell. Again, it's really tough when you, when you, when you can't see behavior from fossils. Not a lot of behavior anyways. Some, but not a lot. Precocial is a word that means babies are mature and they're mobile, they're ready to get up and go. Creatures that are precocial would be like baby chicks or baby horses, the foals, um, things that are, that are born and they're just ready to go. They're ready to run, the frolic and play and eat and do their thing. Versus altricial is the other kind where babies are a little bit more fragile, they take more care from their parents, say like a baby bluebird or baby humans, kittens and puppies. They need a lot of help from their parents because it takes a while for them to get up and go. Tiny diamond-like scales covered her hide, moving her tail like a shark side to side. So they have found scales from mosasaurs, fossilized scales from mosasaurs, and they're they're really cool little diamond shaped scales. Some of them, like on this picture here, have ridges on the tops. The ones on the back had ridges called keels, and those help you move straight in the water. The ones on the belly were a little bit more smooth, so they did not have a keel. To help her swim, there's a fluke on her tail, a long piece of fin that worked like a sail. So this long little, little fleshy part of, of skin there did not have any bone attached to it. It was just like a shark tail or a tuna tail where they had that extra piece of, of fin coming up. So it's also made out of cartilage, which is the same thing that makes your nose nice and flexible and it makes your ears nice and flexible. So if she lost a tooth, fear not, she's like you. But her sets kept growing far more than two. So we only get two sets of teeth. We get baby teeth and then adult teeth, and that's it. When, we, when we're done, we're done, we're on to dentures or something else. Um, so I don't suggest you lose your second set of teeth. Brush your teeth, floss, gotta take care of what you have. Most Mosasaurs, if they had lived on land, would have probably had terrible breath. I'm, I'm sure they wilted all the seaweed next to them uh, because they never brushed their teeth and they would just keep losing their teeth over and over and over again. So they didn't care. So her cousin Komodo walks with four feet flippers for water help her quest to eat. That was when we talked about how mosasaurs have flippers instead of feet. So any of your varanids and your monitor lizards still have feet. The mosasaurs came in different sizes. Like fish in the sea, each specializes. Cladastes was small, two to four meter. Bus lung tylosaur, fearsome meat eater. Cladastes was pretty small, very, very delicate looking mosasaur, and your average school bus is about 30 feet long. If you take the length of a school bus and then add another third onto it, you're looking at about the length of a tylosaur, which is a really big beastie. Globidins crush shells with big rounded teeth. Platycarpus prefers fish from the reef. Different teeth specialize in eating different things. Platycarpus had big pointed teeth, which are great for snagging slippery fish, versus globidins, which had these big round, like it, they look like globes, which is why it's called a globidin. They would have these big round crushing teeth that were good for grabbing hard objects or crushing shells. Did they eat ammonites? Did they eat seashell, other, other seashell mollusks, uh, clams? Uh, it's hard to, hard to say. They start 100 million years ago and last until the asteroid death blow. Sadly, they went extinct at the same time as dinosaurs. Today they're all gone, what's left in the ground. Her bones are now rock, a fossil renowned. Any of the imprints or any of the fossils, any of those scales, they're all turned to rock now. Their bones were discovered like dinosaur, sea monsters invaded stories of folklore. Mosasaurs have been known to, to humans and have been written about since the late 1700s. They make for the perfect sea monsters. They've got teeth, they're long, they're sinuous, they look like sea serpents. If you were uh, somebody who was wandering around in the 1700s and you saw one of these things weathering out of the cliffs, what kind of a crazy beast was that? They started invading maybe some of our folklore, any of our stories. 
Paleontologists work with the past, wrap up what's left in a thing called a cast. When we dig in the field, we can't just take these bones back with us. We can't just pick them up out of the ground. Otherwise, they fall apart. Sometimes they're very, very fragile. So we have to wrap them up like when you break a bone in a plaster jacket or a cast. Digging with picks, tiny brushes, and care, soft gypsum pieces in need of repair. The jaw that I held up, and I'll hold up again afterwards, uh, was made out of gypsum. Gypsum is the same thing that makes up plaster or sheetrock, and it's very, very soft. We have to be very careful with it, because I can actually scratch it with my fingernails. It's sad they're all gone, but don't you dismay. Put back together, they're now on display. We do our best to get these things back up on display and, and show and tell for people. Uh, that way, you can still see what they look like, even though, what, falling, even though, <laughs> They're gone. Yes, I'm tripping over my own feet. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you the jaw again here. So here we have that Mosasaur jaw again. You can look at it a little, let's see if I can get the camera to focus. Come on camera. There we go. You can see all the little cracks running through here. It's a very, very delicate piece. It's very soft. I still have to hold it very delicately because I can scratch this thing. But not all of them are preserved with gypsum. Some of them are preserved with iron. It's kind of one, one end of the spectrum or the other. They're either really, really soft or they're really super hard. And this is one backbone. It's kind of big, I'll back up. This is one backbone from one of the tylosaur-sized creatures, so that bus-sized creature. And it's very heavy. It's preserved with iron. You can see all little details on there. It is a big beastie. It's very heavy. And this thing was preserved in an iron concretion. So it was like gobbed all together inside the rock and we had to chip it out of the rock. But that meant the bone stayed nice and safe. The tail is really cool on these mosasaurs because they're a chain of backbones. So here we have a chain of tail bones. Chain of backbones all stuck together. And these three are stuck together. They're from one of our plaster jackets. And these spines up at the top here are the same types of bumps that you can feel on the back of your neck. So if you feel on the back of your neck, you can feel these little bumps, and those bumps are called the spinous process. And that's what these are. These are spinous process, but they're in the tail and not in the neck. And because it's a reptile, it has an extra little special feature on the bottom side of the tailbone here, it's something called a hemal arch. And if I flip it upside down here, it looks kind of like a slingshot. It's a Y-shaped bone that's hooked on to the bottom side of the tail, like that. And this thing is not only a muscle attachment, but it helps, if I tilt it this way, you can see it's, it's hollow in there. There we go. It's hollow, just like the top is hollow. That holds a lot of your blood vessels and nerves. The top hole here holds your spinal cord, so that's the, the big bundle of nerves that comes down from your brain and goes all the way down through your backbone. And it goes all the way into the tail. So that top one holds the spinal cord and the bottom one is holding all of your blood vessels. So everything stays nice and safely protected in bone. Kind of fun. All right, so I have a little specimen here. I'm gonna to have to adjust my camera so that you can see it here. So hold tight. Whoa. I'm gonna show you it this way. This is a Mosasaur hand bone or hand that we discovered. Whoa. Here we go. This is a hand that we pulled out last year up in the Pembina Gorge. We we're very excited to see this. You can, you can see my, my thumb sitting here, and you can see how small these little paddle bones are. This is coming from a baby mosasaur, not an adult. Ah, that's pretty cool. We're all very excited. All right, I'll we'll hook this back in here. I want to leave the last little bit here for questions. So if Clint has some questions that, that he's, he's taken, <laughs> he's taking a lot of notes off to the side there because I can't read as fast and talk at the same time. 
So uh, we got? I've responded to quite a few questions, but I know not everyone's watching the chat. So we run yep. back through some of these. Sure. Some of the questions were, uh, were Mosasaurs venomous? Were Mosasaurs venomous? What'd you answer for that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not so much. Uh, venom wouldn't do a lot of good in a water environment just because the water is going to wash away everything. So like the Komodo dragons, which have a festering bacteria culture and nasty stuff that's all dripping and drooling in their mouth, um, the water would just wash that away. So you're not going to have that. However, really cool thing is that they do have a split on the roof of their mouth uh, that's called a fenestra, which is also in, in the varanids, in, in the monitored lizards, which probably means that they did have a forked tongue. And why do creatures have a forked tongue? Well, it's forked because each side of the tongue can smell differently. And so they're tasting the water and that tells you directions. So if something over here gets tasted first and then over on this side of the fork, the mosasaur knows that it needs to go this way to find something. So it's actually a directional cue on their tongues, which is kind of cool. So yeah. Someone wants to know what your favorite dinosaur is. <laughs> What's my favorite dinosaur? Triceratops. How do you know that that's a baby mosasaur paddle? How do we know that's a baby mosasaur paddle? Good question. So part of it is because we do have a little bit more of the rest of the hand and the arm bones for that specimen too. I just didn't have them for show and tell. And the ends of the bones are not quite fused. On adult animals, the ends of the bones, which are where you're growing, fuse all together so that it's a nice solid piece. And on that particular specimen, the ends are still not quite fused. So we know that it's a baby. Could they walk on land? Could they walk on land? Probably not very, if they did anything, it'd be like, a little galumphing belly flop type thing. Maybe, maybe imagine like what a seal could do. Um, probably, probably not very well at all. They were heavily modified for ocean swimming. What would feed on mosasaurs? Ooh, what would feed on mosasaurs? Other mosasaurs, so cannibalistic again, uh, sharks would feed on them. Uh, larger, uh, the pliosaurs were pretty much going extinct by that time. So they were, almost the top of the food chain. So basically sharks for scavenging and, and uh, other mosasaurs, bigger mosasaurs. Mm, who's the cute buddy on the shelf behind you? Who's the cute buddy on the shelf behind me? That's Trico. Hi, Trico. It's because I like Pokemon. Were they related to sharks? Were they related to sharks? No. Sharks are in the fish family tree. So they're related to uh, skates and rays. Uh, sharks are related to skates and rays and other cartilaginous creatures. So their skeletons are made out of cartilage. Again, the squishy stuff that makes up our nose or our ears. Uh, uh, but they're, they're not even related to, to the bony fish like a tuna or a carp or anything like that. Um, so the mosasaurs are on the reptile end of the tree, other lizards and snakes. What do you think about the Loch Ness Monster? Is what do I think? Oh, what do I think about the Loch Ness Monster? Um, I want to believe. Okay, no, the, it has the totally wrong habitat in order to actually support a big creature like that. As much as I love monsters, I love sea monsters, I love dragons, I love all kinds of, of mythological beasties. That's why I got into paleo in the first place is I like monsters. Um, no, I, it's... Not not a great habitat for a big lone sea monster. Did mosasaurs have good eyesight? Did mosasaurs have good eyesight? Um, that is a good question. We're not entirely sure, but some of them had something called a sclerotic ring, which are bones that help support your eye. Um, a lot of birds also have this, other reptiles have this, and it's good for pressure. So it, it can resist any of the pressure, in this case, water pressure instead of air pressure. Um, so it's, it's helping keep the eye stable, but I don't know how well their eyesight was. I know, we know that he had a, a good sense of smell, but I don't know about eyesight. Could mosasaurs communicate underwater like whales and dolphins? Ooh, could mosasaurs communicate underwater like whales and dolphins? That is also a good question. We don't know. What's your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> What's my favorite Pokemon? Anorith! <laughs> Anorith is awesome. 
Ah, uh, Anomalocaris. Even though I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, I gotta love my little invert Anorith. He's pretty cute. Uh, it says, where can we get a copy of your book? Uh, the yeah. book is free online, so you can get it through our website. And uh, you can also get a hard copy from the museum gift store over at the Heritage Center. Which so both. Are they are, yes, they are $2.99 for a hard copy printed version. Okay. How long did Mosasaur live? How long did Mosasaur live? Has anybody aged them? I don't know if anybody's aged them. That sounds like a future project is what that sounds like. Oh, you got Clint excited now. <laughs> I have no idea. I don't think anybody's ever done aging on Mosasaurs. How can they keep their eyes open underwater? Ooh, how can they keep their eyes open underwater? Yeah. Um, well, they would have had eyelids like your regular reptiles, but they probably would have had something called a nictating membrane. So snakes, uh, you can see this a lot of times on snakes or like the sea snakes, will have a separate membrane that can help cover their eyes in order to keep sand and grit and, and foreign objects out of there. So it'll, it'll help protect their eyes a little bit. Is a mosasaur a type of whale? A mosasaur is not a type of whale. So whales are mammals and they're very recent creatures and mosasaurs are reptiles. So even though uh, reptiles in general are cold-blooded, looking at their body plan and how they're moving and how their bone structure is set up, uh, it's looking like mosasaurs would have been a warm-blooded creature or at least something more like a tuna where they're their metabolic rate is so high that they're essentially acting warm-blooded. Um, if you've ever gone tuna fishing, this is kind of a cool thing. I know I'm running out of time here. Uh, tuna fishing, uh, if you get them and don't immediately put them on ice, they will cook themselves. We went charter fishing and it was really fun. We caught it, they called it a bait tuna, but it was like, you know, that big. It was still a big fish. And so we, we actually got to eat it right on the boat because it was so hot. It was so warm-blooded on a fish that it literally cooked itself. It was the coolest thing ever. I never thought that a, that a fish was, was hot, and the tuna definitely was. How much different was the climate in North Dakota when the Mosasaurs were here? How different was the climate in North Dakota when Mosasaurs were here? So we figured that the temperature was a little bit warmer, uh, a little bit more temperate, um, but not like rainforest levels. So we're not talking about like the Amazon basin or anything like that. Uh, it would be more like Florida. A little warmer, maybe no snow. If you find a tooth in your backyard, could it be a mosasaur tooth? Mm. If you find a tooth in your backyard, yard, could it be a mosasaur tooth? It depends on where you live. Uh, if you are in Bismarck, no. If you are south of Bismarck, maybe. If you are up in the Pembina Gorge or down in the western corner by Marmoth, Raymond, and Bowman, maybe. So it depends on where you are and what rock layers are around. To, to find stuff in. Can they eat a person? Can they eat a person? I suppose it depends on how big the mosasaur is and how big the person would be. Thankfully, they're all dead, so we don't have to worry about getting eaten by mosasaurs. Did they live in Glacial Lake Agassiz? Did they live in Glacial Lake Agassiz? That's a good question. So a lot of people get mixed up with how old Lake Agassiz is, and Lake Agassiz is actually very young. So Lake Agassiz is only about 10,000 years old. It's, it was uh, around with the last glaciation of, of North Dakota, which was about 10,000, 12,000 years ago. So no mosasaurs in Lake Agassiz because they would have been all gone. Uh, but they did used to live in something called the Western Interior Seaway, which was a big body of water that split North America in two. So it stretched all the way up north to the Arctic Ocean, all the way down south to what is now the Gulf of Mexico, and it basically split North America. And if you live in Bismarck, that is beachfront property right in the middle. Off to the east, you would have ocean, and off to the west, you would have delta. So the flatlands where where all of the, the water runoff is coming from the Rocky Mountains, it's coming down the mountains and across the, the flat delta into the Western Interior Seaway. And so then that finally dissipated around, what, 55 million years ago or so? Somewhere around there. So after the dinosaurs went extinct. So we had that, that water for a long time. Could you find Mosasaur fossils in the Red River? Uh, could we find Mosasaur fossils in the Red River? Uh, probably not, not unless they washed in from somewhere else. 
Um, there's a lot of glacial till, all of the crushed up rocks and sediment that's just kind of washed across the Red River Valley. And so it's not, it's not the greatest fossil picking area. Believe me, I know I grew up in Moorhead and I dug in my backyard all the time. I probably drove my mom crazy. Sorry, mom. Same with Fargo. Same with Fargo. Yep, same, same with Fargo. Yep. Um, if a T-Rex and a Mosasaur were to meet, which would, would, which would win? Ooh, if a T-Rex and a Mosasaur met, who would win? Uh, I would say it depends on who, where they met. If they met on the shore, T-Rex would win. If they met in the water, the Mosasaur would win. Yeah. Let's see. What would they do if they met a shark? They probably didn't meet sharks. Let's see. What would they do if they met a shark? Sharks are pretty speedy. And, and they're, they're pretty self-sufficient. Um, I don't know how many shark remains have actually been found within the belly cavities of mosasaurs. Uh, I do know gar have been found in mosasaurs. So these guys, it's a gar. It's a kind of a kind of cool fish. You can actually see them in, in pet stores too sometimes. They are lazy fish, they're really cool. Um, they just sit in the water column. They're, they're predators, so they just kind of float in the water and then they flick their heads to the side and snake a little minnow and down the hatch it goes. But I know gars have been found in bellies of mosasaurs. Uh, the biggest mosasaur would have been Mosasaurus hoffmani, which is sitting at about 17 meters long. It's a giant of an animal. Let's see, did mosasaurs travel in pods? That's a really cool question. Uh, I have no idea. Again, that's a behavioral thing that we really don't have a lot of evidence to see, uh, but I would love to find out. That would be really cool. Were they solo? Did they have families? I don't know. Who would win most of I know we're just about out of time. Uh, if it cuts out, everybody, first of all, I wanna say thank you for joining us. And tomorrow our topic is coprolites. So tomorrow should be a fun topic of poo and droppings and whatnot. So tune in again, same time tomorrow, 10 o'clock, we'll be on here. Uh, same, paleo time. same paleo time, same paleo place, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, who would win a mosasaur or a megalodon? Uh, they would have never met because megalodon is also a very, very recent creature, uh, dying out two point whatever million years ago. Yeah, about two and a half million years ago, they went extinct. Uh, and by, by that point in time, we were totally dry. We didn't have any of our Western interior sea wave left at all. Uh, we didn't think that sharks necessarily went after the living mosasaurs, but we do have evidence that they fed on dead ones. We'll get mosasaur carcasses that are sitting on the ocean floor, and the bones will be all jumbled and, and torn apart, and then interspaced in them <laughs> uh, would be little tiny shark teeth. So uh, we do know that they fed on carcasses. Let's see. Hey, there's got to be a food chain for everything. If nothing fed on the dead mosasaurs, then, then you would have a whole bunch of things filling up the bottom of the ocean. So everywhere there is, there's nature's cleanup crew. All right. Yeah, it's going to kick me out in just a little bit here. So thank you again for everybody for, for, for coming by. That was awesome. Um, Feel free to give us feedback on Facebook or Twitter. Let us know how we did. If if we want, if you want us to keep doing this, or if this is like, nah, this isn't too much. This isn't cool. This isn't fun. Or uh, I don't know, talking about dead things, talking about fossils. Uh, but yeah, tomorrow, hoop. And send us ideas for future yes. topics too. Yes. Let us know what you want us to chat about. So if you have ideas, anything you ever wanted to know about, uh, paleo fossils, T. Rex, Triceratops, Dromaeosaurs. Uh, clams, snails, you name it. Uh, I'm sure we can find something to chat about. All right. Cool. Until tomorrow. Take care, everyone. We'll see you later. <laughs>